All right. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening or good morning. Welcome to the topology optimization webinar. Today we have a session dedicated to topology optimization for additive manufacturing. It is organized by my colleagues Matthias Nangana and Chang Ayans uh, from the neighboring faculty. So it's really nice to have uh, uh, this session. Please take it over, Matthias and Chang. Okay. Good day, everyone. My name is Chang Ayans and I'm working in the Delft University of Technology and along with my colleague, Matthias Langalar. So today we have organized, uh, as usual, the three talks, uh, which is around the team, additive manufacturing and topology optimization. So we are going to start with a review paper. And for that review paper, because Matthias and I were among the team of co-authors and we wanted to discuss the parts that we have written and we also invited Mohamed Bayat from DTU, our colleague, who has a very good overview of the entire paper. So we are going to try to take advantage of the webinar uh, environment and try to smoothly swift between different speakers. So that will be the first talk and I'm going to announce the speakers and the talks uh, that there's going to be two more talks after the, the first one. So I think without further ado, Mohammed, please kick off the, the first presentation. Uh, sure. So I just share my screen. Thank you, John, for the introduction. And I just want everyone to confirm whether they can see the screen. Uh, can you see my presentation slides? Not yet. Um, yes. Yeah, that's good. Because uh, now that you can see this, uh, OK, so as you can see, I mean, as also John mentioned, it's going to, uh, our presentation is going to be a, a primarily revolving around our paper, Publishing Progress in Materials Science, which is a huge uh, collaboration work between three universities, the TU, uh, TU Delft, and University of New South Wales. And the topic of the presentation or the topic of the paper, the title of the paper is Holistic Computational Design within additive manufacturing through topology optimization combined with multi-physics and multi-scale materials and process modeling. And we have scheduled the presentation in this order. So I will give an overview of the paper and uh, predominantly the section related to uh, process simulations. And then it will be followed by Matthias and John. And then it will be ending again uh, by me who will give some conclusions and future remarks. Uh, so basically, for those of you who are very mathematically uh, involved in the topology optimization or who do not, do not have a deep background in 3D printing, I thought it's uh, important to mention what this metal additive manufacturing or in the abbreviated form MAM is. So it, it's a layer by layer manufacturing process and typically we divide them into two major processes of laser powder bed fusion or LPBF where we build the sample in a layer by layer or a discrete uh, manner. So we have the uh, build table, the powder table, and the coating mechanism that adds a layer of powder on top of the build platform. And then the laser comes into the game and starts sintering the material uh, selectively. And we have a more continuous way of printing and that is via the directed energy deposition process where uh, we continuously inject or deposit the feedstock material on top of a base plate as it is demonstrated here. We did this experiment uh, a long time back, four years ago. And that's why if, uh, I mean, you consider to, uh, this metal additive manufacturing process, it might be, it, it might seem to be a very cool process, but the issue is that it is not a defect-free process. Even though you can realize a topology optimized uh, geometries, but on the other side, you also have a lot of defects forming if you do not have control over the process. So typical defects could be lack of fusion porosities like the ones shown here from CT scanning and light optical microscopy or keyhole porosities also visualized with the SEM uh, imaging systems, thrust formations, overheating or poor adhesion or at a larger scale where the naked eyes can see, we, uh, we have surface roughness, fractures or on what def uh, deflections. Therefore, one can say that on a, based on a rule of thumb, one can divide this into a meso these defects into mesoscale phenomena and also macro scale phenomena. Uh, that was more or less the divisioning right before we published this paper, but then we decided to 
make a more, uh, I would say, accurate or precise uh, divisioning. And that's why we subdivided them based on length scale into three classes of simulations of micro scale, where we look at microstructure growth and grain nucleations, uh, the position and scale simulations where we look into whatever is happening around the deposition site. For example, we have the DED process where we look into powder gas dynamics or melt pool simulations with or without fluid dynamics. And finally, when we do not look at the deposition sites and we ignore them or bypass them by means of uh, shortcut methods, we have part scale simulations where we look into an entire part uh, and we predict uh, variables over there. So, but the idea behind this paper was uh, just uh, somehow get rid of this traditional divisioning based on length scale or physics only. And that's why, why we propose uh, cross-linking between different models. For example, we have microstructure simulations and the position scale simulations. And uh, we also could have had an isolated part scale simulation, but that was not the point of this paper. The point of this paper was to interlink or cross-link these simulations by means of uh, somehow uh, material multi-scaling methods uh, by making RVEs or representative volume elements or uh, homogenization methods, as you can see here. And then by integrating these into part scale, we have a more realistic part scale simulation and its integration into topology optimization could somehow circumvent defects such as these forming in Inside our samples, like overheating on overhang structures or on printable down facing uh, surfaces. So, the idea is make use of a robust and fast responding part scale simulation, which receives its uh, uh, engineering or average uh, properties from deposition scale or microstructural scale simulations via material multi scaling techniques. And just to elaborate a little bit more about the typical deposition scale defects, we came up with this um, part geometry or this geometry that induces some defects inherently. Uh, for instance, you can have surface uh, porosities on top uh, regularly, or you can have this side wall porosities on the side wall of this uh, house-like geometry, or you can have also drust formations forming on top of the internal channels, uh, as you can see for this uh, geometry, and also uh, very bad overhanging structures or even cracks forming. And that's why uh, we use the position SK simulations uh, to address and also predict all types of defects I have just mentioned. For instance, another example could be this overhanging structure uh, where we use uh, powder gas dynamics models to predict the interaction between the plume and also particles and not melt pool. So whatever happens between the uh, particles, powder particles, laser and gas that falls into powder gas dynamic simulations, category one, and they all belong to the position scale simulations. Whereas in melt pool scale simulations, we have a static powder particles and we specifically focus on the interaction between the laser and the melt pool without any consideration for the movement of the particles. And you can see we can be predicting porosities, internal porosities in agreement with experiments, overhang defects like thrust formation, also in agreement with experiments, and also surface process. But the most advanced simulations of these types are coupled melt pool and gas dynamics models that are the very frontier or on the verge of state of the art. If, and uh, people are working on coupling melt pool scale melt pool dynamics models and spatter uh, models together to go to the next level of uh, mo model complexities. And the takeaway point from this simulation is that they are nice, but they only are confined to very small domains and they're not applicable to an entire part. And that is why we use part scale simulations or shortcut methods such as flash hitting, which is several kinds like multi-shot method, gradual hitting, or flash hitting on its own, or inherent strain simulations that enable us to predict uh, residual stresses and deflections over an entire part that is impossible to do with uh, the position and scale models at this as of 2024. And that somehow uh, paves the way for Matthias, I think, to continue 
the presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Mohamed. I hope now uh, we switch to my screen. So indeed, Mohamed showed a lot about uh, uh, various effects in the process as well as the simulations that can be done. Now we switch gears to topology optimization. And as part of that, uh, the review paper not only contains a lot of information about additive manufacturing, but also actually a very nice introduction and overview of uh, topology optimization, from which I've taken uh, some of the figures here uh, on this slide. So also, if you are looking for a good source, a good, uh, yeah, up-to-date overview of this field, uh, it's definitely worth checking out uh, the paper also for that section. And that also brings me to, uh, yeah, the motivation and the challenges uh, connected to topology optimization and additive manufacturing. Because if we look at a topology optimi optimized part, such as, for example, uh, this one here, you can see that the geometry of this part is, is fairly complex. And with conventional methods, it might be very hard to manufacture it. So that's ideally suited for uh, for additive manufacturing, where, yeah, you could almost think you can make almost anything. But as we've seen from the defects that Mohammed already has shown, there are also limits to the additive manufacturing process. And uh, to deal with those limitations, uh, especially if we want to do that in connection with topology optimization, one, uh, one practical way could be to look at the design rules that have been developed in an additive manufacturing field uh, for which people without doing any further simulations already know that uh, certain parts are going to be uh, of bad quality. And this picture here, it gives an overview of various of these uh, of these design rules. They're typically geometric rules, such as uh, minimum feature sizes, the overhang angle of certain parts, uh, the fact where there are enclosed voids in your structure, yes or no, particularly with powder bed uh, processes, that is, a, that is a problem because you cannot get the powder out. Um, design of supporting structures uh, at overhanging sections, the choice of the build orientation of the parts and the combination with uh, subtractive uh, processes as well as being able to reach uh, everywhere. Well, that's way too much to talk about in the few minutes uh, that I have here in this webinar. So I've selected here three of these to give a glimpse of uh, yeah, what is uh, what you should think in these for these uh, topics. So that will be overhang uh, and closed voids as well as uh, build orientation. And by the way, and that's for our entire presentation, we have left out all the references because, yeah, it's uh, it clutters the slides, and there are way too many references to fairly uh, give uh, justice uh, to to all the authors active in this uh, in this field. So therefore, all the references also you can find in our uh, review paper. But starting with the first topic, overhang angle control. Uh, Mohammed already mentioned this is a limitation of many processes that. As uh, the overhanging surface, uh, such as this one, has a shallower angle, the surface quality becomes very bad and the part uh, becomes uh, unprintable. And if you take your topology optimized structure, uh, whatever it is, and you just straightforwardly try to print it, what may happen is that those regions that are overhanging are actually not printable at all and, and end up uh, missing here in this picture. So you see, you would lose a lot of performance of this, uh, of this part. Well, the common solution is to add support structures, additional structures that you have to remove afterwards. Uh, so that's extra uh, material spent, extra printing time, and a lot of time for the poor guy who has to take this all off uh, of the structure again. So it's much more uh, preferable to try to design a part in such a way that you have n good performance, but also good printability. And that's possible in many cases. Uh, this is called also a, a self-supporting design. So actually the supporting structures form part of the structure itself and contribute to the structural uh, function. Well, there's a large uh, uh, body of literature on how to do this in a topology optimization method. And summarizing that very, very crudely in one slide, um, you could say there are two main uh, directions there. What we see is, uh, people have used uh, the inclination of the surfaces themselves and, for instance, uh, implemented constraints on those to, in order to control uh, this overhang effect. Um, that might end up in, in structures, as you see here on top. So in this case, uh, actually, all the surfaces, they meet the overhang requirements, uh, but it's, the part is still not printable because we see parts that just uh, uh, start somewhere in midair. Well, to avoid that, typically some sort of additional constraint or a certain length scale uh, control is added uh, to prevent that, and then you end up in a nice structure such as the one you can see here uh, on the bottom. The other 
class of uh, techniques. Oh, and by the way, I should mention in the density-based methods, for example, you can very nicely do this by uh, making use of the density gradient, which gives you a direction of the, uh, of the boundaries of the structure. The other category uh, doesn't directly measure the overhang uh, angles of the surfaces, but uh, kind of simulates the whole printing process. And using rules that uh, material should always be supported by some material underneath, you can make sure that the part that comes out is actually manufacturable. And indirectly, this also enforces then a certain overhang rule. Well, as I mentioned, this doesn't really do justice to the entire body of work, but uh, I hope it gives you an, an idea of the methods. Uh, this, I would say, relatively uh, mature. It's also implemented in, in various commercial codes. And here you see an example of a part designed by uh, such uh, overhang control methods where you can see various features where uh, actually these overhanging surfaces are supported by uh, some supporting integrated supporting structures. What you may also notice is these two perfectly round holes here in the center. That's not typically what you may see from a topology optimization. And in fact, they were added afterwards. And that brings me to the second topic. That is the topic of uh, enclosed voids because behind those two holes there, inside the structure, if you take a cross section is a very large uh, cavity. And those two, two holes were added to make sure that the powder could be taken out. Um, those kind of post-processing uh, decisions you preferably would like to avoid because although there are small holes relatively to the part, they may influence the functionality. So there's also work on methods to control that you don't have these enclosed voids in your, in your final design. Uh, so in fact, that's controlling the topology within a topology optimization process. Um, for instance, if we take this, uh, this beam here, we can see if we consider this as a 2D printing problem instead of 3D printing just for illustration purposes, that all these cavities uh, are not connected to the outside of the part. And therefore, if this would be a powder printing process, uh, powder would be trapped. Well, that can be detected by uh, solving an auxiliary problem. And uh, popular problems are, for example, a certain thermal problem, but uh, there's also papers on a certain connectivity eigenvalue problem and various other uh, uh, approaches. And by that, we can detect if a certain cavity is, uh, is, uh, is enclosed, fully enclosed in the part. Then you can put a constraint on that and make sure that you get designs that are not having such cavities, such as the design you can see here over on the right. Um, but yeah, you can maybe imagine it's also a rather extreme uh, uh, measure and you may lose quite some performance by such uh, strictness. There's also an in-between solution. And that is to say that wherever there is an enclosed void, in fact, you, you want to uh, activate an overhang constraint such that in the enclosed voids, you don't need to place additional support material, but these are, these angles are all according to the overhang criterion. That only works for non-powder-based methods, but uh, nevertheless, it's it's a way to uh, yeah stay closer to the to the true optimal design without uh, these constraints. I'll come back to this uh, on the next slide because the third topic I wanted to quickly touch on is uh, the one uh, uh, regarding the influence of the build orientation. If you look at this part here, you can see that there's an enormous difference in the amount of support material that's needed to print it, depending on how we orient this part on the base plate. Uh, so yeah, that's an important uh, consideration to how to orient parts also for surface quality. And uh, the downside of, or the challenge is that uh, if you look at these uh, orientation variables, the behavior of the amount of support versus these orientation variables is quite multimodal. So it's quite a difficult one to include in an optimization process and find a good, uh, a good optimum. But nevertheless, this is an active uh, area of research and also here solutions have been uh, proposed. And I just quickly want to present here this, uh, this example of a, a hook. It's not really about the details of the example, but uh, what it nicely shows in this uh, sequence of, uh, of iterations is that together with the, with the layout of the material of the part, also the orientation, the printing orientation is, uh, is optimized. And in this case, just like on the previous slide, in the enclosed voids, the overhang constraint is activated. In the non-enclosed voids, such as this one here, it's not activated because there potentially you could have support material that you can easily remove. So in this case, this would be a combination of N-built orientation optimization and enclosed void detection, as well as 
overhang uh, control. So three measures in one. So all in all, we see that uh, indeed these geometric uh, design rules can be implemented in topology optimization and even complex uh, combinations such as these uh, can be can be created. But still, then we are still missing some essential aspects uh, of the printing process, and that is something that uh, John will address. Thank you, Matthijs. We're giving a nice overview of how uh, geometrical design rules can enhance the manufacturing build of designs. However, not all effects can be captured by these simple geometrical rules. For example, the defects that are due to key holding or lack of fusion, overheating that you can see, but the discoloration of this piece of material where is running on a constant overhang angle, which seems to be benign in the beginning, but all of a sudden becomes a problem. And, and again, a most notorious of the problems that are the part distortions and the associated residual stress that leads to a lot of uh, printing uh, defects and also uh, out of spec, spec components. And in order to account for these kinds of effects, the thermal and the mechanical state of the material or the component during the manufacturing should be accounted for. And this requires actually incorporation of the process simulation into every and each design iteration that we have. And the challenge here is that the, the computational cost has to be somehow restricted. And that comes from the fact that AM processes is a, inherently a multi-physics and a multi-scale method. So modeling it is, is typically is a high cost process. And we need to find out smart ways to, to tackle with simplifications while still being able to capture the primary effects so that we can guide our design into a, most, into a more favorable processing conditions. So this is a relatively new field of research, but there are again a lot of papers that I cannot really go through all of them. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. So here is an early example where the part design has been fixed, but the support structure has been optimized and the printing process has been mimicked by activating elements in the design domain one by one and with a heat source and then calculating the heat equation, the transient heat equation, and find out a support structure which will alleviate the a lot of heating that would happen when you're printing the material. Of course, this is a nice method, but already in the verge of being computationally too complex, especially if you want to extrapolate it to 3D. So for 3D, uh, there's another work from our group that we, we look into calculating the temperatures through the steady state heat equation and in a small slab that runs through the entire design domain. And by means of that, we calculate a pseudo temperature that does not give the, the actual temperatures, but can lead to uh, identifying features that can lead to overheating in the design. So here you have also seen the experimental validation of that. So on the first column, you see two perspectives of a standard topology optimized design, which leads to a lot of overheating, which is measured by this optical tomography method. On the middle, what you're looking at is a, uh, an overhang constraint design. So this is, of course, better than the first one, but still has some features, which is like this funnel-like structures that can lead to overheating. And finally, the physics-based topology optimization, which which can further reduce the overheating that you can see on the right-hand side. So coming into mechanical constraints, the most popular method to incorporate this is the inherent strain method, where we actually assume that a simultaneous deposition of the entire layer of the uh, component and mimicking the thermal uh, contraction by an inherent strain that is injected into the model. So on the right hand side, you see the, the calculation of the deformations through this inherent strain method and incorporating that model into the topology optimization. Uh, we can, for example, have a look at the, the constraint, for example, how to make the component do not clash with the recorder, that is a, a common uh, printing failure. So for example, in this design, what you see is that the intermediate density features which are appearing over here, which is reminiscent to support structures that are basically strengthening the, 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 uh, the, the, com the, the binding of the material of the component to the base plate. Another example that I want to show you is, is that, uh, 
by means of doing some design modifications, we can actually uh, decrease the amount of deformation that happens after the part has been cut off from the base plate. And another example, which is a 3D case example, where again, the, the distortions on the printing direction has been restricted after the part has been cut off. So finally, I want to also give you a few examples uh, from methods that are towards integrating the part process and property optimization. The first one is in fact, looking into the deposition sequence optimization with looking into methods such as large scale direct energy deposition, where you can have a freedom to actually not only deposit everything layer by layer, but you can also do uh, deposition by using curved layers. And by means of just optimizing the deposition sequence, you can see a, a, a prominent change in the amount of deformations that are happening over here. So this method has been also uh, is, is, is implemented so that a simultaneous deposition sequence and the topology optimization can be done. Another example, which uses the level set method to simultaneously uh, optimize the, the, the topology and also at the same time, the laser track so that you can have a more uniform uh, temperature evolution when the this layer has been scanning. And finally, yet another example uh, where the material properties has been also trying to be controlled. In the small control volume, what you can see is that the design has been changed in such a way that the critical cooling rates that are happening during the manufacturing process can be controlled, which leads to uh, different microstructural phenomena which leads to different distribution of yield strength. For example, the yield strength in this material can be uh, prominently increased by means of changing the design in, in this such a way. So this is all I want to say in this limited time and I will uh, leave the floor back to Mohammed to give some uh, concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, and I will also share my screen. Um, so basically, this is the last slide that we are presenting, and this is basically our conclusion slide. Um, so as a conclusion, one can say that uh, we have a wide variety of process simulations, ranging from uh, micro scale to the position scale and also part scales. And from a physics point of view, one can say that we have uh, grain growth models, milk pool simulation, powder gas models, and residual stress uh, predictors. But uh, Sorry for that, yeah. But uh, what, uh, what is also important to note is that uh, these simulations or these uh, deposition SQL simulations are quite computationally heavy, even though they are nice. But that's why we go for shortcut methods uh, such as part SQL simulations that enable us to predict an entire uh, a variable on an entire part within an acceptable time. And this would uh, naturally allow for linking them with topology optimization. Even though we need to also Remember that for geometric design tools, uh, even though they are quite mature, still we have open challenges, including them uh, into uh, the calculations. And also the future directions could be that uh, like interlinking micro scale, the position and scale, uh, part scale simulations via material multi-scaling for an improved topology optimization. And the second uh, investigation track could be the involvement of and integration of design process materials into uh, topology optimizations, basically what we are showing, showing here. So an updated particle simulation that uh, leads to, uh, it's a process simulation that is involved in into the topology optimization leads to minimize defects as John, as John also mentioned. So, I mean, if you have any questions, just you can let us know. And thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? Okay, in that case, I think we can move to the next talk, which is going to be given by Peter Jensen from DTU, and he's going to talk about infill optimization. So I'll 
leave the floor to Peter. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, yeah. Yes, so uh, I'm Peter. I'm from uh, the Technical University of uh, D2, uh, the Talk Group. Um, uh, and thank you for the invitation to the Talk webinar. Um, so as Ken mentioned, we're going to present our recently published paper uh, titled Efficient Investor Sign uh, Structure Infill for Complex Engineering Structures. And this has been a uh, collaboration between uh, me, Tim, Andreas, Nelson, Ole from uh, the DTU Top Up Group. Um, so one of the motivations, uh, two of the most motivations behind this work is that uh, large-scale policy optimization have given many new insights into structural design, um, but uh, it's often required uh, at large, a large computational uh, scale, um, as for example, the, the famous swing uh, model, um, and and uh, which is which are not um, readily available for the every engineer. Furthermore, uh, additive manufacturing has become more mature for industry, um, which also promotes uh, topology optimization methods suited for uh, additive manufacturing specifically. Particularly uh, in this case, how we can couple um, the internal structure infill as a significant um, um, structural member and not just as a space filling uh, part as seen uh, on the figure, right? So one uh, method that can uh, address uh, both issues are the dehomogenization approach. And it's a two-step approach. Um, first, you solve a multi-scale topology optimization problem. Um, afterwards, uh, we dehomogenize uh, this structure to a single scale um, structure based on some heuristic um, where we want to approximate conformality of the unit cell, but also control uh, or have some have some size control over the unit cell. Um, now, what makes dehomogenization um, efficient is that we can solve the multi-scale topology optimization on a very coarse scale uh, based on uh, a, a, a periodic microstructure um, where we can then uh, uh, project this uh, per periodic microstructure to a finite periodicity based on a minimum length scale with the dehomogenization and then get a single scale projection out with a very fine um, uh, length scale and, uh, and fine structural details. Uh, in our case, we want to maximize stiffness, so we formulate a minimum compliance pro problem uh, subjected to a uh, volume constraint. And for our microstructure, we use a rectangular hole microstructure. It's similar to the stiffest optimal rank free microstructure, but it's formulated in a single uh, single scale. Now, the single scale formulation means that it's not as stiff or uh, as the uh, rank free, uh, but it's very close. Um, and the microstructure consists of uh, yeah free uh, orthogonal periodic walls with the thickness W as seen here on the left. Um, now, the downside about the model, model is that it's a uh, purely numerical. We cannot, uh, we, we have no closed form solution, so we need to inter interpolate based on numerical homogenized data. Uh, to avoid very thin uh, width um, in our microstructure design um, or uh, to optimization design, um, we bound our width. Um, to a min and a max, uh, while also including a indicator function such that we can um, indicate if we have material or void. Um, and that is uh, seen on the example here. Um, and we can further introduce uh, link scale control um, with robust formulation on our indicator uh, variables. Um, furthermore, we can uh, reduce non uniqueness um, from our microstructure by uh, minimizing um, the uh, indicator field. And we simply add uh, this as a penalization term to our objective uh, value in our optimization problem. Um, in order to rotate the microstructure, we simply rotate the frame of, uh, of uh, our microstructure by a simple transformation. Um, here we should note that we are not uh, updating our rotation based of uh, 
principal stresses, but uh, by gradients, as there is uh, some unique uh, non uniqueness uh, issues with uh, principal directions. Um, in general, there are non uniqueness issues with uh, uh, these laminated microstructures, uh, which can cause uh, local minima or non smooth behavior. Um, so to mitigate this, we penalize um, uh, the um, orientation between uh, or in, in orientation between uh, neighboring uh, microstructures uh, by aggregating uh, a dot product um, in the neighborhood and then adding that as a penalization term as well to our objective. So that leaves us with a, a multi-scaled multi uh, structure where we have a set of thicknesses uh, and a set of frames, which we can then project to a single scale with dehomogenization. And there's a vast array of different methods, methods for dehomogenization, and that's an ongoing research field. In, uh, in our work, we adopted the stream surface-based uh, dehomogenization approach, which is a rather new uh, method published in our group. And as the name uh, suggests, it's a method where you trace a surface uh, similar to a streamline um, through uh, our microstructure uh, such that these surfaces align with, uh, with the orientation of the microstructure. Um, the uh, unique feature about this is that we don't uh, necessarily need to adhere to any labeling of uh, the microstructure. And how that works is that we first trace a dense set of surfaces, um, and then uh, we can select a set of uh, these surfaces based on a given periodicity and and minimum length scale, and then thicken these surfaces into um, a volumetric solid. For a base uh, mark example, we first look at this Michel uh, cantilever beam, um, where we use about 200,000 elements, uh, hexahedral elements, um, for optimization. Uh, for optimization, and we get a result, uh, as you can see here, um, which mimic um, the individual microstructures. And if we dehomogenize that, we get a structure out looking like this, and we can see we have a porous uh, internal structure. Um, the coloring here indicate uh, the strain energy density, and we can see that in most cases of the internal structure, it's uh, it's fairly uniform, which means that we are we are adhering to our optimized uh, solution. There are some low and high spots around uh, the solution, and and these are primarily where the assumption from our material model does not adhere um, or take into account. Nevertheless, we can um, produce a projected design uh, with uh, a very uh, low, different, uh, low uh, difference in, in both volume fraction and weighted compliance on an hour on uh, equipment equivalent to a 32 core workstation computer. And if we compare that to a conventional large scale uh, design with the same minimum length scale that takes uh, Almost or more than 100 uh, million elements and over a thousand compute cores. Um, whereas for our dehomogenized design, we can obtain that uh, under an hour. Um, so that's a speed up of almost 200. Um, now, in order to promote uh, better infill um, that can con contribute to both uh, sniffers and strings, we introduced this co coherent indicator field that can control how many uh, layers are active if a material is active. And we simply do this by penalizing the individual indicator uh, fields based on the projection scheme. And that would look something like this for our cantilever beam, where we can see we get this herringbone or crisscross pattern, um, which uh, aligns with, this, uh, with the principal stress directions, which tells us that this infill um, introduces uh, uh, stiffest contribution. Um, this, of course, also limits the design of it, so it in, it increases uh, the um, the compliance uh, a slight bit. Um, now we can look at a bit more interesting example. This is a uh, load tower subjected to a torsion um, load case, and you would expect a cylinder uh, shape uh, design uh, for this load case. Uh, but if we introduce uh, these um, um, infill requirements, um, we now get these uh, patterns. And interestingly, uh, if we analyze this for buckling, um, we can see that our uh, buckling load factor 
uh, almost uh, increases tenfold uh, simply by introducing this uh, uh, um, regularization scheme. So not just uh, do we have a stiffness contributing in fill, but we also implicitly have a strength, strength contribution um, in fill. And for showcasing this on a, a bit more uh, com complex engineering example, we have this uh, G bracket um, here for our single load cases uh, with two uh, different uh, load cases as a thing. Um, these models are a bit more complex to solve, so our speed up is not as, um, as impressive as seen before, but we can still match the simp uh, or the large scale um, results uh, pretty pretty well. So to sum up, we have uh, uh, proposed a, a dehomogenization uh, procedure for complex geometries where we can uh, control uh, stiff or uh, uh, control infill um, for uh, or for stiffness contributing infill and also uh, increase mechanical stability. Um, we're right now looking into multiple loading case problems, um, and it could also be an interesting to try to additive manufacture some of these uh, examples, as I've seen or shown. And lastly, I, I would just mention that we're also looking into using uh, laser-based deal modernization for these examples. So thank you for, uh, for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Peter. Anyone who wants to unmute and ask a question? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, could, could you please go to the last um, bracket page? Thank you very much. Um, can you explain the visualization of the right image, please? Sorry, can you come in? Can you please explain me the visualization of the right image? Is it does it look like set or is it some uh, uncovering of the surface? So this is the internal structure you're seeing here. Yeah. Um, if if that was what you're so I, I just it's just a, yeah the internal structure that, that look like okay. looks like this. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. This answers the question. Nice presentation, thank you. Thanks. Hey, Peter, I also have a question here on this slide. So you have an NA. This N, does it indicate the frequency of your dehomogenization or it indicates like how many orthogonal plates you have for your yeah. microstructure? Yeah, so it, it indicates that, that if there's a material active, we want to have the free active uh, material uh, or if as a sorry if there's a uh, material that is active we want to have three active layers so in this case we have layer going this way this way and then we have uh, you can see the, the plate going out here um so and 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 for an a2 you can then see we only have two layers active if there's material active we could also have uh, three layers active uh in this case on the right um but uh, it's not a uh, Shown right here. Okay, thanks. Hey, I have a question as well. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't quite clear to me. Um, in these info problems, are you achieving a lower compliance relative to a fully solid example? And if not, what what's the advantage to the info solving the info problem? Sorry, I I could not uh, understand that. There's some uh, background noise. Oh, sorry. I'll try again. If not, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, it wasn't clear to me if you're achieving lower compliance values as compared to a fully solid problem. Mm. Um, so the the fully fully solid problem would then most likely be something looking like um, our simp or these uh, large scale problems where we, you don't promote uh, any kind of porous uh, infrastructure. And we can match this with, uh, with the dehomogenization approach. So it is similar, 
if I understand your question correct. Okay, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. So in view of time, I suggest that we move on to our last speaker, Joseph Kubalak from Virginia Tech. And he is going to talk about the optimized tool paths in manufacturing. Perfect. Hopefully you're seeing screen or slides at this point. Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, there we go. All right. Yeah. Thank you for the invite and thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Joseph Wallach. I'm a research scientist at Virginia Tech. Um, in contrast to the previous two presentations, uh, I'm going to spend my time talking a little bit more about how to actually manufacture these parts uh, and the new opportunities that specifically robotic additive manufacturing give us in, in generating uh, design spaces and fabricated parts with 3D aligned uh, uh, fibers within the structure. Um, so given the name of the whole webinar, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this slide, but additive manufacturing in general, and more specifically material extrusion, are anisotropic processes where the deposition direction is significantly stronger than the inter or intra-layered bonds in the part. Uh, and this is especially true for reinforced materials, where the filler inherently aligns to the deposition direction, dramatically increasing anisotropy. Um, and for continuous fiber materials, this could be an order of magnitude difference in the deposition direction and the interlayer bond strength. Um, now, for conventional additive manufacturing or layer by layer additive manufacturing, you can tune the direction of that fiber filler within the XY plane, um, but you have no real opportunity to align deposition directions outside of that plane. Uh, for that, we need to really turn to multi-axis robotics, which does enable that 3D alignment of material deposition. And this is kind of a snapshot of the literature space, um, but there's been a number of researchers to show preferential alignment of that filler to the load pass in the part to improve mechanical performance. However, the big gap on the manufacturing side is that the design work for both the geometry and the tool path were done relatively manually. Uh, the geometry was determined a priori, and then a tool path was developed that would be printable on your deposition platform, but there was no kind of integrated design uh, of material distribution and orientation. Um, for that, we would really like to turn, obviously, to topology optimization. Um, and there's been a number of works in literature looking at combining material orientation with the distribution problem to solve those simultaneously. Um, and even in the XY plane, this has been reduced to practice all the way back in 2016. Hoglin and Smith showed that they could generate uh, tool paths aligned to uh, an orientation field, fabricate those parts, and demonstrate mechanical property performance improvement. This was also shown by Bedetti et al. on a material jetting system. Um, but for multi-axis material extrusion, two big gaps still exist. Um, the first being the integration of manufacturing constraints. The first presentation talked a lot about integrating DFAN considerations into topology optimization. There's still a big gap in identifying DFAN considerations and applying them in topology optimization, specifically collision constraints imposed by the multi-axis platform. Additionally, um, as we saw in the previous presentation, um, uh, there's a lot of work being done in dehomogenization techniques. Um, in this presentation, I would like to differentiate infill pattern from tool path plan, where the infill pattern is kind of the, the uh, the higher level abstracted geometry that you're printing, but the tool path is actually how the uh, uh, deposition platform is actually executing the creation of that infill pattern. Um, and so in solution to those two gaps, we're in pursuit of solution of those two gaps, we have developed this topology and tool path optimization workflow where we take design criteria, establish a material distribution and orientation map, we process that design space with a kind of generalized 3D version of a slicer to propagate deposition paths aligned to the material orientation field. As you'll see, this is very similar to the streamlines-based approach you saw in the previous presentation. Uh, but then we order that toolpath for collision-free deposition, um, leveraging the kind of order-free uh, nature of the toolpath to uh, really get really nice alignment of our deposition paths. We can then take that toolpath um, and plan joint trajectories for our robot. For the sake of time today, I'm not gonna walk through all of this workflow, um, but just in very brief, 
Our TLO algorithm looks very similar to those you see in literature, where we assign a density and orientation variable to each element in the design space. We are specifically using naturalized quaternions to reduce uh, convergence to local minima in that orientation space. But then we also have applied a set of manufacturing constraints to again, reduce uh, the collision potential within the design space, um, essentially penalizing uh, collision uh, instances in the design space to ensure printability or improve printability of the resulting design space. And you can see the effect of that penalty on a very uh, simple design space uh, where the unpenalized version has very steep build directions required that would cause the tool head to collide with the build platform at these you know, interfaces here. Um, but in the penalized version, we get much more shallow build directions, reduce that collision potential and have a much more printable geometry out the other side. Once we have that um, orientation field and material distribution map defined, we can generate uh, a tool pass aligned to that orientation field. Again, not gonna spend too long on this. The previous presentation uh, gave a really great overview of streamlines approaches. Um, but with ours, you know, we get very good alignment and agreement between the uh, populated streamlines and the underlying orientation field. And again, the hypothesis here is that that orientation field is aligned to the uh, load pass acting on the part. And so therefore, so are our deposition paths. Um, so I'll use the remainder of my time to just give a few examples of the application of this workflow on, in both planar and multi-axis contexts. Um, so first, this multi-loaded tensile and distributed bending load, our TLO algorithm generates this optimized design space where road directions are denoted by pixel color. So in this green truss here, all the deposition paths are identified to be oriented in this kind of negative 45 degree angle. We can then generate tool paths uh, uh, aligned to that orientation field. You see our streamlines based approach gives very good agreement and we'll quantify this on the next slide, agreement between the alignment of our deposition paths and that being prescribed by the orientation field. And even in these you know, grip regions, we see very good agreement between the kind of uh, in and out behavior of the deposition paths. For comparison, uh, we generated tool paths using the same design space, but more conventional tool path planning techniques being contour and uniform. And we actually quantify that alignment between these deposition paths, or sorry, these tool paths and the underlying orientation field, where the streamline gets nearly 100% alignment to the underlying orientation field. It's about 95, 97%. Whereas the more conventional toolpath planning softwares get about 75 to 70 percent alignment. This enhanced alignment corresponds to uh, pretty dramatically improved mechanical properties of uh, printed samples. Uh, so this is just with a short fiber material, but in tension, in tension rather, uh, the improved alignment of our toolpath nearly uh, over doubles the mechanical performance of this printed geometry. These same algorithms scale to multi-axis deposition or full 3D. Um, so we see a curved tensile bar design space here and a blown up view of a, a specific subregion. The red vectors are the deposition directions being prescribed by the TOO algorithm. And the blue vectors are the tool orientation that the, the deposition platform should be assuming to fabricate that structure. We can again propagate deposition paths and I'll highlight the alignment of the streamlines or the deposition paths to the prescribed orientation field. And then we can order that tool path for collision-free deposition. Um, so the deposition platform should print the green deposition paths first, go up through blue, red, and then end at the black deposition paths printed last. Uh, quick time-lapse of this deposition process. Again, short fiber. Um, but simply by tweaking the orientation of the tool path within the structure, we're getting nearly a doubling of mechanical performance in the final geometry versus conventional XY planar printing. Uh, again, these same ideas can be extended to continuous fiber materials. Uh, we can just swap out those constitutive properties um, and be optimizing for that completely different material system. Uh, the one kind of extension that was required here is an orientation filter uh, to basically smooth out the turning radius being prescribed to the continuous fiber material because we don't have quite the same uh, articulation freedom with the much stiffer material system. 
But you see very good alignment of the deposition paths through the truss structures. And even in these grip regions, you see very smooth fiber paths being prescribed by the orientation field. We can take that tool path, sorry, I'm running short on time, um, generate deposition paths that are again, aligned to that orientation field. And even in these thin truss members, we get very good alignment of those deposition paths. We can go all the way to printing. Um, and this is just a, you know, short snapshot of the toolpath, uh, as you see very continuous motion between the point of load and point of support, where a continuous fiber is, is moving continuously between those two discrete regions. Again, this is only possible for this geometry with multi-axis deposition. And then in terms of mechanical performance, um, it's nearly an order of magnitude over more conventional XY planar deposition of short fiber. And even over multi-axis deposition of short fiber, it's still a 3X performance improvement. Um, there's still a lot of work we could do on the material matching side of things. We got a lot of fiber pull out, but we're really excited about the opportunities of this integration of design optimization and robotic toolpath planning. Um, so in summary, we have this whole workflow to connect uh, design optimization to robotic toolpath planning to fabricate parts uh, that accounts for manufacturing constraints imposed by robotic deposition and continuous fiber. Um, and we are dramatically improving performance uh, in these toolpath optimized structures. There's a lot of future work. I know I'm over time, um, but both on the hardware and the design side, there's a lot of future directions we're interested in moving. Um, but with that, I will open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Joseph. There is already one question in the chat, so I'm going to read that to you. Great. Is the orientation optimization performed after finishing the topology optimization for the model? That's the question. Good question. Yeah, so there's been some literature. We have not explored this question ourselves, but there has been some literature to support that simultaneous optimization of the orientation field and density field results in a more performant design space. Um, so we are doing that. So we are simultaneously optimizing the density distribution and the orientation of that material system. Good Thanks. question. Uh, I also have a question, Yosef. Yes. Uh, about collision detection. Yeah. Uh, for all the different uh, streamlines, is it always possible to find a collision-free printing pass, or you have to divide the streamlines into smaller segments and in order to make it a collision-free? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, so no, yeah, uh, short answer is no. It is not always possible to find a collision-free toolpath. Um, there are a number of instances where toolpaths need to be uh, segmented or um, otherwise made discontinuous in order to get a printable toolpath. Um, that's really where some of the additional manufacturing constraints on uh, printability would come in. Um, so for the, for instance, uh, you know, filtering mechanisms to smooth out fiber fields are, are really important for continuous fiber materials. But uh, yeah, so our, our Short answer to your question is our ordering algorithm has some um, contingency plans for, uh, you know, uh, modifying the toolpath in order to make sure a collision free ordering is is achieved. And another question in a printing, do you change the fit rate to create variable thickness because the streamlines, they are not always parallel, which means the gap is varying. So how do you cope with this? Yeah, um, so right now we don't. Um, there there has been some work in literature on varying uh, printing parameters to get that variable thickness. Um, but right now we are kind of relying on the uh, approximately even spacing of the streamlines and kind of uh, maybe overfilling the space to make sure that we get uh, a more you know continuous part. Thank you. Or, or solid part rather. I have a question also. Uh, thanks, Joseph, for the talk. Could you go to your very last slide? The one with yes. the pictures uh, across. This one here? No, one one more, I think. No, you had one where you had sort of six pictures of manufactured structures sort of in the middle of the thing. 
uh, before that, then. sorry. Is, is it this one here, or? No, no, they were on the center line, those pictures. I don't know. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Yes, 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 this one. This one, yes. So I was wondering, so in contrast, Peter's talk before, he had sort of three directions everywhere. You have a strong requirement that at any point you can only have one direction. And so if I look at the third picture from the left, it sort of looks like you have a layered structure. So you have some uh, directions and then you have another layer with diagonal parts. Yes. But I think the topology optimization, the filtering there would hinder that in happening uh, if, uh, because it wouldn't like two layers to have different directions. So I'm wondering if you're sort of, well, how was that designed, this uh, third picture from the left? Gotcha. Yeah. So the the this is a snapshot of a few different projects we have going on. Um, the uh, I guess both of these pictures here are on a, a conformal deposition side of things, where we are adding material deposition onto the surface of the structure, um, not necessarily topology optimizing that conformal deposition. But I guess it would be an interesting topology optimization problem for you to allow layered structures where each layer can have a different direction, right? Yes, yeah, not to um, get too far in the weeds, but I'm, I'm really interested in the ideas of applying some of the shell infill structures that you've been working on uh, on uh, towards these ideas of, you know, having maybe two different overlapping orientation fields, one specifically in the shell, one in the infill. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. I think we just now fill the hour. If there is no burning questions, I think people are already moving to their next appointments, as I can see from the part space in this. But I just want to thank you for your attention and also uh, want to thank Joseph and, and Peter to accept our invitation. Yun, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, well, we have a next webinar on data driven multi scale topology optimization. It will be on the 26th of March, so in one month. And after that, we will have a much scale topology optimization using the gradient-based optimization or the more conventional approach. And uh, hope to see many of you there. Okay, so goodbye for now. Bye. Bye.